right now I'm feeling totally drained, <laughs> totally tired, and totally on edge, and I feel like going up there and killing it again. I'm about to snap on it, and then it'll probably snap back. We receive a frantic, and I do mean frantic, call from Jackie Hernandez. We listen to it on the machine, and she is frightened out of her mind. Ah! I'm not staying here, Barry. I'm out of here. I gotta get out of here. I can't stay here. The objects were being thrown across the room. The kids' toys were being levitated off the ground. I was just ready to, like, uh, just jump in the truck and just drive until it ran out of gas. Uh, Master. Jackie? The phone conversation was interrupted. The call was interrupted by um, it was dis the, it was disconnected. Jackie. Jackie. We, we were talking. Hello. You just cut the line. What happened? Are you guys Jackie? there? Are you guys there? Yeah. Are yeah. You, yeah. Good. You know she won't get any sleep. We better go down and get. You. Jackie. What? We're gonna come down and get you. Okay. Okay. All right, um, uh, we're, we're coming right now. Okay, hurry, hurry, please, hurry, please. I don't know how long I can stay here. We're leaving right now. Okay. okay. Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance for this part two. What you just heard was a clip from the documentary An Unknown Encounter, a true account of the San Pedro haunting. How's it going, Lance? I'm doing fantastic, Tim. I hope everyone out there who's listening is doing great. We did release part one a couple of days ago, and we're excited to release part two. Again, the audio that you just heard was taken from a documentary called An Unknown Encounter that is available on YouTube. We highly recommend that you check out the full documentary that was made in 1997 about this haunting. But Tim, you know what's been haunting me for days? How you're doing. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm, I'm terrified. Terrified about these two episodes. This story is wild. I can't believe there are physical apparition attacks or something it makes me wonder though like what really is going on here is this some kind of carry situation for jackie i know I, I don't think we really explore that too much but i do wonder about that there is a lot to wonder about this because there's even moments where we try to scientifically break down why somebody would see something like a violet hue just sort of floating around. You mentioned carry there's so much of that telekinetic force that you feel is in there and we don't dig into that too much so maybe we'll have to have a follow-up on it i don't know what's happening here and lance if you want to hear this episode ad free our listeners can now do that by subscribing to crawl space premium right there in the apple podcasts app it's 4.99 a month you get early releases you get ad free episodes and you get our fabulous weekly bonus show and if you're not an apple user you can go to crawlspace.supportingcast.fm and sign up for the exact same product there you know what else people have thought to have some telekinetic powers, Tim? Our social media. Ah, yes, we do. <laughs> yes, uh, you can follow us at Crawl Space Podcast or Crawl Space Pod. And if anybody who's listening is connected in any way to the individuals involved in this or they know the locations, please feel free to reach out. We'd love to dig into this a little bit more behind the scenes. All right, everyone, we're going to break quick for commercial here. We'll be right back with Christy Arnhart. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. Okay, so tell us about this parapsychologist named Barry Taff. Yes. he, Like I said, he's the team that led on to the Queen Mary. He was very popular in the 80s and 90s, being the first paranormal team in to see these things. And having witnessed the Doris Bither case, I mean, that would just ruin me for life. I'm afraid I'd be afraid of everything after that. But uh, he was very intrigued by her story, and he agreed to come out with a team, which is consisted of Jeff Wheatcraft, who was their camera photographer and Barry Conrad. Barry handled the video recordings and the sound. Jeff is your skeptic. Dr. Taff, of course, is your believer. And I never really got a good read on Barry Conrad. I think he was there just to have fun, honestly. <laughs> yep. And this looks like it was. 
Yeah, except for Jeff, whose sort of journey here is um, something to follow for sure. Jeff's part in this was truly scary. It really was. I know on either the first or the second day that they were there investigating, they're hearing voices from the attic and it sounds like a man. All of this, like I said, it's on video. They recorded everything that they did. It sounds like a man running around upstairs and they decide, well, let's just go to the attic and see what's going on. So they send Jeff up, of course, with his camera. They all take turns going up at one point or another and they have all kinds of different things go wrong. Sometimes their equipment will work, sometimes it won't. Sometimes when they go up there every noise stops just on call. There are other times they can still hear it while they're up there but they can't place any of it. Whether it's voices or bangs it doesn't matter. But whatever it was it seemed to really go for Jeff Wheatcraft like it didn't like him. At one point while he was up there he kept telling them you know he was like I'm so afraid I can't even turn around. I'm too scared to turn around is there something behind me? They're like, no, why don't you turn your camera around and take shots behind your back and we'll see if we can catch anything. So as he's taking these pictures, a couple of minutes into it, they hear him scream and then a big thud. He comes shooting out of the attic. They're like, what happened? He said, you know, I'm taking pictures over my right shoulder and somebody grabbed my camera and threw it. So they go upstairs, put up high powered lights so they can see every corner and there's Jeff's camera without its lens laying at the opposite end of the attic inside an old fruit crate. The lens was lying 15 feet away, port side up on the other side of the attic crawl space. Larry Brooks asked him what he would think about going back up into the attic and taking shots with his camera over his shoulder. I started clicking off some photos. It was dark, totally dark. I fired first, I fired second, and just as I fired into the third frame, something pulled this camera from my hand. And we all hear this scream. We hear Jeff just this, this loud scream. And everybody, you know, instantly runs to the kitchen, which is right there by the laundry room. And we see Jeff. Jeff comes out of the attic, and he looks as white as a ghost himself. He was shaking. I go back up there with lights this time, with a flashlight. I don't see my camera in the position that I was. I look back in the corner. All of a sudden, I see just the lens sitting there. In the corner, in the other corner of the attic, was the body of the camera lying upside down with the lens port, the lens port laying straight down into a box, you know, just an old crate that was in the attic. Now talk about your first fright right there. I knew there had to be something. There had to be something in that attic. Truly bizarre. You know, I don't have any explanation for that. And then in watching the documentary again, Jeff seems very, very serious about this. Like there's no hint of a joke or them taking this lightly in the slightest. No, Jeff really went into it hoping to see something. And unfortunately, he got way more than he planned on it. Because, you know, the rest of that night, like I said, their power went on and off. They could smell the stink of iodine everywhere. Now the house was went through. They looked through it. There would be times that they would smell iodine iodine so much and then bam it was just gone well if you've got an open container or you have spilled iodine something in your house i mean that's going to be obvious the smell is not going to go away that quickly so it was odd that it just kept popping in and out like that can we just discuss real quick what the smell of iodine is is that like an alcohol smell you know it's been so long since i've smelled it i don't remember let's look it up strong sharp biting it's an irritating odor is what it says. Do you think that there's any significance to this iodine copper connection to whatever entity is doing these things? Tim looks very shocked right now. <laughs> Well, yeah, just Googling what does iodine smell like, it says here at room temperature, iodine crystals readily vaporize to a violet colored gas. Are you serious? Yeah. So I guess the question is, did she have iodine in the house and not know it? Or is this because of the haunting? I don't know. That's very good. Good catch. Mm. Thank you. Real time discoveries here. <laughs> Telling you history being made. I'll, I'll send the document. It comes with like a two-page PDF. Okay, awesome. I do feel like there's a significance between the iodine and copper. And the, I don't know what it is, but I do feel like there's significance to it. And I do feel that they're connected. The entity wasn't done with Jeff, was it? Oh, no. 
No, unfortunately not. On their second visit, I think it was, again, they sent Jeff up to take pictures. Gary was up there with him. They took pictures for a while. Gary says, all right, we're done. So he comes down out of the attic before Jeff Wheatcraft can come out. They hear a gasp and what almost sounds like a scuffle. You know, they see the flash from his camera, but that's it. So they go up to check on him and Jeff is actually hanging from the ceiling. He's supported by a crossbeam and he's got a piece of clothesline wire that nobody had found when they'd searched the attic before, knotted and wrapped around his neck and hung over a nail that's been bent up. So, you know, he's struggling to get himself down. Gary has to kind of lift him up off the beam so he can get enough leeway to get the clothesline off of it. Unfortunately, there was no camera up there when that happened, but as soon as they clear the attic space, they start snapping. You can see Jeff in his position, hanging, the look on his face. When they brought him down, he still had a huge red line across his neck just from the seconds he was up there. But yes, did not care for him. Yes, that is absolutely terrifying. And you do see these pictures of him in the uh, documentary. This isn't like some Zach Baggins, like camera trick, you know, melodrama going on. It is very very, very scary. And something that we've never heard of before when we've talked about hauntings, that it gets this physical because with one slip of his foot, he could have died. He could have hung himself by accident. It's pretty crazy. I told you, get down, get, get down. down. There was a moment, momentary space in there where everything went black. Jeff Wheatcraft was physically attacked in this attic on September 4th, 1989 by an invisible force that actually pulled him up onto a nail protruding from a rafter beam and actually tried to strangle him to death. I don't remember being lifted up there, but I was actually hung. I was hung in an attic and he helps me off of this nail. He had a horrible time getting Jeff down from there and those were very anxious um, moments that passed because we didn't know whether to go up there or what. We knew something happened. Jay, this isn't a good idea. This isn't a good idea. This isn't a good idea. idea. And what happened was I found Jeff was was not standing upright. He was over like at a 45 degree angle and he, he was wrapped, entirely wrapped around one of the, the slats holding the, the roof up. I mean his legs, I mean he was like basically off the off the floor because his legs were wrapped around this beam. It was like he was like wrapped around there holding onto this thing for dear life. Uh, the expression on his face though indicated almost like he didn't even know what was going on. That was like one thing that impressed me about the expression on his face. I mean it was obviously he was like scared and knew something was happening but it was like he didn't know what. And can you imagine just coming out of that that dark space of time that I lost I mean I felt so out of control. Mm -hmm. This sounds like the kind of thing, I mean, just based on the pictures of the video, like it doesn't look like a position Jeff would have intended to get himself into. Certainly doesn't seem like you would have done that playing a prank on the other people when you're investigating a haunting. No. It's like, unless he's suicidal, I don't see a person getting themselves into that position willingly. No, because it's not even something that he could have walked under and accidentally hung himself by. I mean, you had to be put up there. Please get down. I got to get out of here. Well, it's definitely raising me up. Jeff, please come here. Get this for me. Get the mic. Get the mic. Jeff, here you go, buddy. Here you go. Here you go. What the hell happened? Are you okay, buddy? Oh, Shit. God. Look at his neck. Oh, Jeff, come on. what's behind your neck? Well, I don't know. What's on my come neck? On, come news. on down. Come on down. A piece of rope. Oh, shit. Gary, get down out of there, buddy. I knew you should. Can you find my glasses? Gary. Glasses. Jeff. Look at this. Jeff. Look at Jeff. this. Turn Jeff, the camera. Jeff, are you okay? Jeff. I'm fine. Jeff. Tell me what happened, buddy. Well, I don't know, Gary. I told Gary that there was nothing happening up there, and he turned around and came. He was coming this way. All of a sudden, I feel, feel this thing around my neck, and it's got me hanging, hanging, and it's pulling on my leg. You were hanging? Yeah, I was hanging. That? Gary had to bring me down. Yeah, that's remarkably scary to me for the things we spoke about. It's just surprising to see a haunting enter the physical realm like that. Well, and that's something that a lot of people don't understand. When you have these general hauntings, residuals and whatnot, you don't have to worry about getting hurt. But when you're dealing with a poltergeist where objects get moved, things like that, you can be hurt. You know, you walk down some stairs and feel a light push or a rug gets moved out from under you. You can fall, you can hurt yourself in all kinds of different ways. Objects can get thrown at you. 
Yeah. Poltergeists are, are a lot more serious than the regular hauntings that people are used to. Well, I don't want one, Christy. No. <laughs> but you did highlight the type of knot. What is this knot that the rope was tied into? They do tell what it is in the documentary. It's a knot that seafarers use. And it's a very common one that's used all the time by them. But you evidently, it's not something you'd use normally in everyday life. It's more for boat use, things like that. He was connected some way with the ocean. Back in the 30s, they all used it. It's been used for hundreds of years. Well, here's your bowling. That is a very common knot. It's used every, every day by seamen, by fishermen. But the the entity still went after Jeff. They did. And that's something that we see throughout this is anyone who comes to the house and experiences anything will usually have an experience at home. It's almost like they're tailed for a day or so and then it wears off. But uh, Jeff said he always felt like somebody was behind him. He always felt like he was being watched. He would feel bony hands on him at times. At one point, he felt one on his lower back. And when he came out of his attic search and showed his lower back, he had a a red spot in his lumbar region. Well, over the next couple of days, it starts to hurt him so badly, he goes to his chiropractor. His chiropractor tells him that it looks like he's had a traumatic internal bruising that's happened to his lower back, almost like an accident of some kind. Well, if it happened at the house, we know he didn't fall because, you know, the footage is pretty consistent. But yeah, I mean, that that put him down for several weeks. Yeah, I would expect it to have kept him away from the uh, investigation forever, not just several weeks. Got a push. I was standing right here. I was holding the uh, video camera, the uh, Sony. Brett, we turned the camera off. Yeah, we turned the camera off. We were here talking. We were here talking. And uh, all of a sudden, it, it just hit me in the back, pushed me right on the bed. And thank God the bed was there to, to break my fall. I don't know if you could see anything. Okay, well, uh, oh gosh. Yeah? It looks like, oh my gosh, it was right in here? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, you have a very red mark right there. I'm going to get a close up of that. Very- I think somewhere in, in this side here, yeah? Yes, sir. The, the repeated attacks on Jeff were not laughed off. In fact, he had to take repeated vacations or, just say, retreats away from his family, his friends because the response he had to this was one of post-traumatic stress disorder. So the indication here is that the glowing light, the orbs, were in some way damaging Jeff's back. Yes. And if they're spirit orbs, I could see them doing it. Mm. I've never known spirit orbs to attack somebody or cause pain, but they're a manifestation of that spirit. So I don't see why they couldn't. Even after the investigation, things got worse at his house. You know, there would be times he would come in and the burners on his stove would be on. He'd have open flames burning. He came home one time and his broom had been set on top of one of the burners, but it hadn't been turned on yet. And then there was another time a box of 22 bullets had been set on the burner. Come on. Serious. I'm serious. He would find scissors all over the house. He got into bed one night and there were open scissors under his pillow. At 3.59 a.m., Conrad tried an experiment. He placed an envelope and pen in the middle of the stove, hoping that the entity would write a message. Five minutes later, the envelope was on fire. Oh my gosh! Oh my god! Come in here! Barry! Barry, get this! Oh shit! Look at this! It moved the paper on top of it. It's now burning the paper. It's lit the burners and it's burned the paper. As the night grew longer, it was apparent that the thing in the apartment was not about to leave. Well, I feel like we need to ask, like, what is it about Jeff that this poltergeist (laughs) decided he was the one he was going to stick to? Well, I guess a Ouija board was brought in at some point. And one of the entities said that Jeff looked like the man that had killed him. And evidently he would just take that aggression out on him anytime he saw him. Jeez. Mm -hmm. Not very understanding. Jeez. Yeah. God, Jeff can't help that. No, no, he can't. (laughs) And there was even, I mean, so many things about this. I talked about the balls of light that she would see. She took pictures of these balls of light and they were tested because especially back then, anytime you had pictures, Eastman Kodak tested everything to see if it had been tampered with. Eastman Kodak told them flat out, no, this hasn't been tampered with. And the balls of light are not coming from a reflected source because the ball of light itself is what's giving out 
the light. You can see the shadow on the floor. You can see the shadow on the wall behind it. So they're actually something there. And they're not, you know, lightning bugs. That would be my first thing, you know, maybe catch dim light, catch a picture of one, but no, you can tell it's not a bug. You would have several of them all at once of different sizes and shapes. And you also had a lot of, in the 90s, they called them rods. It would look almost like insects flying around during interviews. Uh, some of the rods would go into Jackie's head and disappear and come out later. That's something that we don't see as much nowadays. And I have always wondered, is it because it was a load of crap back then and it was bugs, even though they were telling us it wasn't? Or is there something about the advances in our photographic technology that doesn't pick it up like it used to anymore? I don't know. I don't have an answer to that one. But I do know you don't see rods nowadays like you did back then. You know, it's interesting because we have different technology today. And, you know, compared to the technology back then, even the act of taking a photo is much different today with them being so high quality on your cell phones. And back in the 80s, that wasn't the case at all. So I wonder, and I want to get your opinions on this, is that something Hypothetically, if poltergeists do exist, would they mix in what was just simply a bug or like a reflection, knowing that that will also escalate the situation and escalate people's anxieties? Well, that's a possibility. I did a terrible job asking that question. No, no, I see what you're saying. No, that they're going to manifest in some way that you can see. If they've got enough power to toss stuff around and be this scary, then they're definitely going to manifest somehow. And that could be one way they do it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you're messing with the paranormal, Normal, who knows what they're going to do? I find some of the more effective ghost stories to be psychological ghost stories. And I think that would uh, sort of file into that category, Lance, if they were messing around like that. Right, right. But the old man appeared at Jeff's house. Is that correct? Well, actually, on their second visit, they had film that they had to drop off after they investigated because nothing's instantaneous back then. It all had to go to the photo lab. So... They drop it off at the photo lab and he asked Barry Conrad if he could sleep on his couch because he was just too tired to drive home. Well, in the middle of the night, Barry hears Jeff scream. When he goes out to check on him, he says that he woke up to find the old man from Jackie's house standing in the living room near the sofa. And he didn't do anything or say anything. He just glared maliciously at Jeff. So the old man ghost was at Barry's house still messing with Jeff while he's sleeping on the couch. Yes. No one's domain was sacred. Inexplicably, objects were moved. Photographs were rearranged. A jar of coffee was turned upside down. A bedroom window had been shattered. We attempted to clean up the glass, and I remember that there was this one particular shard of glass that came to a point almost like a dagger. And uh, Barry and I together cleaned up the glass of the window, put everything in a container, took it out to the dumpster, threw it away. We walked back into my apartment, and at that time I had this small typewriter sitting on a table in the kitchen. We look over at the typewriter, and we see a shard of glass just sitting with a point up, shard of glass like this, just sitting right on top of the typewriter. This was one of the pieces of glass that we had just hauled out previously. That is bizarre to me how it can travel, but I, I've definitely heard stories like that before. How it would leave one house and go to another, sort of follow the person and not the location. But what happened with the film? Well, that was the odd part. When they returned to the lab the next day, they found the film had not been developed. There's some kind of a mix-up, right? The envelope that was found that was supposed to hold all of their film, they found the envelope opened in the store the next morning, but it didn't have any film in it. It wasn't until later that day that they found the film and it was lying on the floor in the next room. And when they developed it, none of the film showed anything odd until they get to the pictures that were taken just before Jeff started to complain about the pain in his back. And then you start to see some light anomalies and things like that crop up in the picture. But yeah. I don't think he Interesting. didn't want that developed, I guess. So the old man is bouncing around and uh, even breaking into the, uh, the Photoshop. Yeah, he gets around way more than I would have expected a ghost to. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. 
One of the quotes that you had in the research is that the team felt a sensation of overpressure, like the pressure of being in water. And I wonder if this house was located in an area that had like a high electromagnetism or something like that. Like, was it near a power plant or anything that could contribute to that? Not that I'm aware of. This is just right smack in San Pedro, just in rows and rows of houses down by the bay. But definitely EMF would do that. And maybe it was just that there was so much of that energy in the house that it did that to him. Yes. All right. So now things really start escalating as if it wasn't wild before. The word go has been scratched or written into the wood in a couple of spots. Yes. They found one near the attic door and on the refrigerator, her alphabet magnets spelled out go. No other word was spelled, just go. That is wild. The refrigerator door would fly open as she walked by as well. Yes. And I can only imagine how scary and irritating that was. Nothing hurts worse than getting smacked with a refrigerator door. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, ghost, I've already had lunch. Yeah. And I mean, Jackie wasn't the only person who had this kind of trouble either. There were some renters who had lived there before her that moved out suddenly because they couldn't take what activity they were dealing with. The neighbors said that they constructed a replica of a Catholic altar in their front room. And at night, they said that they would hold religious rituals and they would act those out during the day as well. And there were so many candles in there. The room just glowed in the dark. That seems a little extreme. But I mean, if they're having the same type of trouble that Jackie is, I guess you would go to whatever means you could to try to get rid of that. I don't get the feeling, though, that there were a lot of renters there before her. It never mentioned a long history of a haunting, just that some people had had problems. And I know Jackie doesn't live there today. And there's people still experience some things. Really? Even Mm -hmm. in current day? Yes. Wow. I feel like erecting an altar of any religion to ward off a ghost like this is just making it more angry. If you don't do it right, it definitely will. Yeah. Jeez. And then Jackie felt as though hands were placed on the sides of her head and were pushing in yes. at one point. Yeah. Wow. And that goes into that feeling of overpressure too. It was just her head sealed up. She felt like someone was pressing on her head and she even lost hearing in one of her ears that never came back completely. See, now we can say, safely say, a story about a ghost actually had a lasting physical effect on people. And yes. whether it's true or not we are telling a story about a ghost and a lot of people say well there's nothing to be afraid of because there's no physical evidence out there but i don't know see this is the trouble i have with my niece she's eight years old she comes to me nay nay monster under the bed's not real is it and i'm like um (laughs) that's always a no christy well i know but i feel like i feel like i'm lying to her because you know there might be (laughs) I'm 46 years old and I still stay covered up at night just in case there's a monster under the bed. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, this is scary. And you guys are right in in that this is reported by several people. This isn't just one account. This is several people who had looked into hauntings and looked into this and were all convinced this was all real. And there were real injuries that these people felt. Yes. So yeah, while we can say, you know, ghosts don't hurt people, you can point to the Jackie Hernandez case and say that's not exactly true. Right. Depending on what it is, they definitely can. Okay, so then Jackie was out of there. She was done with that place. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, here's the question. Like, why haven't you moved yet? I don't want to victim blame, but move. I know. And from what I understood, it was just a matter of money. You know, she was working different jobs, just trying to make ends meet for her and her kids. And moving wasn't really an option until I guess about the fall of 1989. She decided she had to get away from all of it. Her and her husband had started to reconcile. So they ended up moving in together to patch things up in a trailer in Weldon in Kern County. But unfortunately, things started up again. At first, everything was great. There was no haunting issues. She All she thought about was her kids and her marriage. And this, I think, is key. When things started to go bad between her and her husband, the haunting started to kick up again. And that's something, if you think about it, if she is sensitive or her children, that type of environment is going to bring more stress and animosity. And that's going to give this thing more to feed off it. But it's sending mixed messages. It wants it to go and then it follows 
follows it. And then what does it want it to do then? I know. It's almost like the old man just wants to terrify her half to death. Usually, you know, it's a case of they're trying to get their story told so they can be at rest. But I don't really think that was the case for at least one of these guys. But at her trailer, you know, it started out with scratching on the walls, noises, talking. Again, she lived in this trailer in the middle of nowhere. There was not anyone who lived close by. She was away from all of her friends. So, I mean, that even just adds to the atmosphere. And it makes her more scared. I mean, now that her and her husband are fighting, she doesn't have anyone to rely on like she thought she did. What actually brought it to a head was one night she decided to move a large screen TV that she had out to an outdoor shed while her and her friends were moving that TV, which was in the San Pedro house. The face of the old man appeared on it and they all saw it. When we uncovered it and moved it away from the side of the building, my wife was on the other side of the TV helping me push, and she said, there's a face in there. She was all animated, and uh, I was directly opposite from her, and uh, I saw it from a different angle, and I said, no, it's dirt, and I reached over to wipe it off, and then I saw the face. The face was real clear that I could see from the opposite end of the TV, and it was just real clear, but his eyes were just staring straight at me, and he was just real, like you said, evil looking. And the friends got out of there pretty quickly. They didn't want to have to deal with that. But this also prompted her to call the Ghostbusters again. So she calls Barry and Jeff. It was April 13th, 1990. I'm sure Jeff was overwhelmed with delight that he was getting another call for this (laughs) haunting. I don't know that I would have answered that one. Nope. Lose my number, Jackie. Yeah, I think I'd have been done with that one. But yeah, they brought in a Ouija board this time. We don't have any footage from the trailer. From what I understand, they had so much trouble trying to get all of their instruments to work that they never could keep them working long enough to film. So a lot of what we get from the trailer is what they have written down. Whose idea was the Ouija board? Bad idea. It says Jackie suggested. (laughs) Come on, Jackie. I know, and I think she had done this before too. And that's like the number one, don't mess with a Ouija board. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a witch and you're on the top of your game, don't use a Ouija board. Just don't. Nothing but trouble. They are. My mother warned me off on them when I was a kid and I didn't listen, which got me into trouble. So I can only imagine this will pass off to my niece now. We'll have to deal with this later. (laughs) (laughs) We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsor. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. She starts asking this Ouija board questions. One of the questions were, how long have you been trapped in the spirit world? And it answered 60 years. Did you die in the San Pedro house? And it says, no. It says, where did you die? San Pedro Bay. They asked, did you drown? No, I was held underwater. Now, I don't really understand that. That is drowning. So I don't really understand that answer. Forced drowning, I suppose. If it's a murder, it's like not by choice. He didn't drown, I think is, yeah. Okay, I hadn't thought about it that way. So uh, the man who was murdered did not live in the San Pedro house. The man who murdered him lived in Jackie's house. So they asked how many ghosts reside among the living, and it says phantoms fill the skies around you. That always freaked me out. Yeah, comforting. That's a dramatic answer that freaked me out. (laughs) It is. Um, I like that they call them phantoms, too. Yeah. But then the phantom was asked about Jeff Wheatcraft. After this session, at the end of it, Wheatcraft was actually thrown from his chair up against one of the walls in the trailer. Jeff, what are you doing? Again, I guess owing his resemblance to the murderer. I feel so bad for this guy, but come on. Like, you're asking for it at this point. Like, you were just in the attic. It wrapped and knotted a clothesline around your neck and hung you. And now you're like, sure, the Ouija board makes sense. I'll I'll sit in on this. (laughs) Well, I guess if you're skeptic. How at that point would you still be a skeptic? I don't know. I honestly don't. So before it gets confusing, this particular entity, this phantom, this ghost that they spoke with through the Ouija board was actually held underwater, drowned by another man. And that man is the one who previously resided in Jackie's house. That's correct. We've introduced a new ghost. And see, that's uh, that's what I always found odd. Yeah, you do have two ghosts in her haunting, but one seems more benevolent than the other. Like the one that they're talking to here, the one that was killed. To my knowledge, she never saw. Him. I don't know that any of the noises or anything that she dealt with was because of him or if it was because of the old man. But he was there. But that's the one that's hurting 
and Jeff. Yes. So they're kind of both bad guys here, bad ghosts. But it was found out that there was actually some historical record of who these people could be? Yes, there actually was. They were wanting to verify some of the information. So Barry Conrad dug through San Pedro's newspaper archives, and he found that in 1930, a Mr. Herman Henriksen, who was born in 1912, had been murdered by drowning in the bay, and his body was found floating under a pier on March 25th, 1930. Now, the Ouija board told them that the spirit had been murdered by someone who held him underwater. Henriksen was 10 years older than the age indicated during this uh, Ouija board session. Because, you know, of course, I didn't include all of the questions and answers that they gave. But according to the answers he gave, there was a 10-year difference. He said, though, that he had had a jagged wound on the top of his head. And the coroner ruled that it had been drowning, that he had struck his head as he fell off the dock. But he says no. And that would fit with Jackie's dream as well. Wow, that's wild. There is an article here about uh, about this fellow from 1930 mm-hmm. from the San Pedro News Pilot in uh, March of 1930. Oh, yes. Wild. It is. And here's something that you don't hear very often. And this is something that I actually found on Instagram and had never heard before. So I guess you can take it as you want to. You know, I don't have the verification for this like I usually do, but it was so compelling I had to include it. The other ghost that resided in the San Pedro house, when Jack Jackie talked to her neighbors. She found out that the bungalow that she lived in was built by a man named John Damon. She believes he's the old man that appears to her, John Damon. But yeah, it looks like they've got two names to put to this so far. And do you know where the information came from that this was a man named John Damon? If I'm not mistaken, all of the John Damon information she put together through the Ouija board itself. I know that while she was visiting San Pedro in the spring of 1990, she saw a ball of light. It was bright enough to be visible during the daylight. It was outside at her house where she was staying. She followed that light to a nearby graveyard where it hovered over a stone marking the grave of John Damon. She said this ball of light went around and around the grave and then just disappeared. She figures that he was saying goodbye before he left. So that came out of the Ouija board sessions. But this is the bad guy. Yeah. I never have understood how these two ghosts interact with this story. I can't tell one ghost from another. You, I guess you can if Wheatcraft is being hurt, but to me, it just looks like a huge haunting. Yeah, interesting. Two separate ghosts apparently involved here. It's definitely interesting. It's very interesting. And when you start getting to what I found on Instagram, I think it just kind of pulls it together and makes it that much more interesting. Now, I do need to say that I cannot find any proof of what this person is saying. This person says they're their next door neighbor is an elderly man who likes to come over and sit with them and have coffee. They talk. This old man claims that while hunting for treasure, because every town's got some kind of legacy here, he says he found treasure in her house in the basement. Now, what's interesting about that, supposedly this is part of Rudicinda Dodson's buried treasure. Back when San Pedro was just starting to grow, Rudicinda and her family owned a lot of the land around there, especially the undeveloped land. And you can still see her name on buildings and businesses that are in town, in that town today. Now, Rudisindra, she was awesome. You know, she was a feminist. She was a philanthropist. She did all kinds of different things. And they accumulated a lot of wealth before she died. When she was alive, she was known to keep two chests nearby. One chest held gold. It had gold bars, coins, and ingots. The other chest held nothing but diamonds and jewelry. The diamonds and jewelry come from family members, their heirlooms, their gifts from people who want, you know, to get her attention and her favor. Same with the gold. But she just kept these sitting in her house and would just add to them as time went on. Before she died, she was said to have hid both of those treasures somewhere in San Pedro. And she had left poems to work as guides to finding these treasures. The little old man, who's the next door neighbor, says he found the gold box. Now, they think that because he found that treasure down there, that is what started the haunting activity. Somebody had to put that treasure there. They think that it's Henriksen and Damon, that they hid the treasure in the basement of the house, and then Damon killed Henriksen to keep the secret quiet. Wow. Every good ghost story has a mystery at its core, doesn't it? 
It does. Wow. This is incredible. And I'm wondering if Jackie had ever considered going the Amityville horror route where the family just cashes in on it. Let's get the books and movies and franchise because this could easily be a franchise. Oh, definitely. Now, Jackie did not make any money off of any of this. Hasn't to this day. And really bringing all of it out into the open brought a lot of scorn. It brought a lot of people who didn't believe, you know, you're just looking for attention. You're looking for money, things like that. She never made any money off of any of this. How is that possible that no one's made a movie about this? I don't understand that either. You have all of these cases that happen. You know, you've got the Entity case. You've got Amityville and all of these that happen, hers is one I never hear about. And it's the one that they've got all of this evidence for. Yeah, right. Yeah, even the parapsychologist guy kind of reminds me of the Warrens a little bit. Yeah. Ed and Lorraine Warren, you know, and and those characters who were real people, those two characters, though, have spurred like what, like five movies now, Yeah, five Hollywood movies, I think, with the Conjuring series and more. So yeah, I'm with you. And furthermore, I'm surprised this documentary isn't more popular because it's really good. It is. And I think if they would go back and redo it and make it, I think, more believable because the special effects and the little things that they added in just made it look cheesy. Make it the case that it is. I mean, this woman had something... She experienced something that the rest of us never in our lives get to. Scary or not, I'd want to know more about it. Yeah, for sure. And if anybody wants to watch the documentary, we'll put the link in the show notes, of course, as well as the link to the other video with Dr. Barry Taft. Now, if you decide you want a more skeptical look at everything that's going on, I, of course, work with John Lorden. He is very exacting when it comes to the paranormal. He is a very tough cookie to crack. But he did a brain scratch on the San Pedro haunting. So you can get more of a skeptic's look at it that way, too. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Christy, for joining us and telling us this story today. This is a uh, creepy story um, with their firsthand accounts. So this is really good reporting. Thank you very much, Christy, for bringing this to us. Well, thank you. I'm happy to. Yeah, really good job. And I can't wait to do this again because you said you had a number of other weird stories that you wanted to bring to the table. Table's wide open for you. Good deal. I can't wait to come back. Almost feel fortunate to have had the opportunity to see the other side, although there's a lot that I would have preferred not to have seen. It was an experience that not too many people get to go through. Even though I didn't want to at the time and I was terrified, I feel feel fortunate to have uh, experienced the things that I've experienced.